Hi everyone, welcome to VLSI Point. So after a long break, VLSI Shweta is now back and this time I am coming with 5 new playlists. Yes guys, these playlists will be very much helpful if you are preparing for jobs, for interviews, even if you are looking to change your job profile in VLSI. So if you are watching my videos first time, don't forget to subscribe my channel because here you will get all the study related stuff of the era. You can also join my telegram group. There are more than 500 students who are discussing their problems with peers and hearing their doubts. So join our community. Without any delay, let's get started today's video. So in today's video, we are going to discuss Verilog interview question. This is the second part of the interview series and in today's video, few of the questions will be theoretical and uh, remaining questions will be kind of numerical questions. So what you have to do, just watch the questions, solve in your own way and then watch my solution. So our first question is, what is the difference between dollar finish and dollar stock? So as you all know, it is a very basic question. And when we have to use dollar for this, when we have to permanently terminate our simulation. So whenever you are giving this command dollar for this, your current simulation will be terminated permanently. You cannot start your simulation after that. However, if you are giving that dollar stop command, then your simulation will be suspended temporarily. That means you can start your simulation after that, that dollar stop command. So, this is the difference between dollar finish and dollar stop and I hope you all know the answer. Now we can move to the second question. So our second question is this one. You have a ring counter, a 7 bit ring counter and the current state is 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. So after how many clock cycles it will come back to the same state. Now you have to find, you have a 7 bit ring counter, how many clock cycles will be required. So start solving and then we'll discuss the answer. So coming to the solution part, as you all know in ring counter, if there are n bits, then n stages will be there. That means to come to the same state you require n number of clock cycles. So here we have 7 bits. So you need 7 clock cycles to come back to the same state. Also, you can just try and do that shifting operation 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. You, are just, you can just start shifting one bit by bit and then you will get the same state after 7 block cycles. So here the answer is 7 block cycles. Now we can move to the third question. The third question is what is race around condition? So in your digital circuit, you have learned about flip-flops. Four types of flip-flops are there. SR flip-flops, JK flip-flops, D flip-flops and T flip-flops. So in JK flip-flop, whenever we give 1-1 one, one input, J is equal to 1, K equals to 1. So that time the flip-flop starts toggling. That means it just rapidly changes between 0 and 1. And that's why we are calling this stage as a race around condition. Because there is a race between 0 and 1. You cannot determine whether the output is 0 or the output is 1. So this is called the race around condition. And what you can do to eliminate this race around condition, you should use master slab flip-flop. In that master slab flip-flop, this race around condition will not occur. The another way is you can increase the delay of the flip-flop in order to eliminate the race around condition. So our next question is, what are the various synthesizable Verilog constructs? So in my Verilog playlist, you have learned about the simulation and the synthesis. What is simulation, what is synthesis? I will explain in very much detail. So while performing the synthesis operation, there are few constructs which is not synthesizable. So suppose you, are, you have written a code and then you want to perform the synthesis operation. But if there are some constructs which are not synthesizable, then your entire code will not perform the synthesis operation. So what you have to do if you want to perform the synthesis operation, use only those synthesizable constructs. So we have various synthesizable constructs. So on the screen you can see we have various data types like wired, wired, or wired and these few data types are synthesizable in nature that we have loops, that if tells, for loop, while, primitives like XOR, XNOR, and OR, NAND, NOR. Then we have few operators like addition, subtraction, less than or equal to or less than equal to. So these are few uh, synthesizable constructs which you can use in your code if you want to perform this synthesis operation. Our next question is what are the features of VHDL? 
So in my Verilog intro videos, I have told you what is the Verilog, what is the PhD, and what is the difference between these two languages. And I have explained in detail why you should use Verilog and when you should use the PhDL. So here also, uh, if you are talking about the PhDL features, then PhDL is a very strongly typed language. That means uh, if you are doing even a small mistake, then you will get a compiler error. However, in case of Verilog, you will not, you will not get that kind of errors. So Verilog is a loosely typed language. However, PhDL is a very strongly typed language. Verilog is very much similar to the C language, however that the BHDL is similar to the ADA and Pascal language. In Verilog you have simple data types, in BHDL you have complex data types. BHDL is independent of technology, it is very efficient, less time consuming, it has more readability. So these are few features of BHDL language. Now our next question is what is the difference between inter-assignment delay and intra-assignment delay? So this is one of the most favorite question of interviewers. Whenever you are going for the interview, 90% of time you will get this question and interviewer will just try to confuse you between the inter-assignment delay and intra-assignment delay. But it is very much simple. First try to uh, know by yourself and then I will tell key what is the inter-assignment delay and what is the intra-assignment delay. So coming to the solution part, suppose you have two variables A and B and uh, it is written that a equals to hash 5b. So what we are doing, we are assigning the value of variable b to variable a after 5 time unit delay. So this is your intra-assignment delay. So what is happening here? So what happens in your intra-assignment delay? It just blocks the assignment but not the evaluation. However, in case of inter-assignment delay, it is written that hash 5a equals to b. So the value of B will be assigned to A after 5 time units. So what is the difference here? After 5 time units, whatever be the value of B variable, that will be assigned to A. So this inter-assignment delay blocks both the evaluation and the assignment. So this is the major difference. Whenever your interviewer asks what is the difference between the inter-assignment delay and the intra-assignment delay, so you have to tell the inter-assignment delay will block both the assignment and the evaluation. However, your intra-assignment delay blocks the assignment only, but not the evaluation. This is the major difference. Now coming to the second question, the how many 2 cross 1 multiplexers are required to make 16 cross 1 multiplexers? This is a very simple question, but there is a smart trick to solve these kind of questions. First solve yourself and then we'll tell you that smart trick. So coming to the solution part, since you have to design a 16 cross 1 multiplexer using 2 cross 1 multiplexers, so uh, one way is you can draw the entire circuit, ki how many 2 cross 1 multiplexers are required to design that 16 cross 1. So the answer is 15. Whenever you will just draw the entire circuit, you will get 15 multiplexer. But that is not the correct way to solve this question. What if I tell you ki how many 2 cross 1 multiplexers are required to make 256 cross 1 months? That time you will not be able to draw the entire circuit. So the correct way to solve these kind of questions will be you have to divide that 16 by 2 plus the answer would be 8. So 8 by 2 plus 4 divided by 2 plus 2 divided by 2. So your answer would be 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1 that is 15 multiplexers are required and this is the correct way to solve these kind of questions. You can apply the same formula for 256 cross 1 multiplexer and if you have to design with 2 cross 1 multiplexer. So this is the correct way and you can solve this question very fast if you are using this technique. Coming to the 8th question, you have to write a very long code for 4 cross 1 multiplexer. Again, it's a very basic question. I have told you multiple times how you can write a multiplexer code. Even I told you the different ways to write the multiplexer code. So first try to write by your own and then I will tell you. So whenever the input is 00, zero S0, zero, S1, then the output is A. For 0, 01, it is B. For 10, the output is C. And for 11, the output is D. So it's a very simple code and you can write this code in multiple ways. Now our next question is, you have to write a very long code for 4-bit ripple counter. So first you need to know the concept of ripple counter. What is ripple counter? How it starts its counting? 
when it will stop so you need to know all the things to solve such question first try to solve and then we tell you the solution so in case of four bit triple counter it starts counting from 0000 four bit and then it will count till four bit 1111 so this is called the ripple counter after 1111 it will again come back to the four zero 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 this is called the ripple counter now in this code we have taken clock reset and q so if your clock and reset will be your input and q will be your output this q is of four bit data type so now whenever you are giving a reset value then your ripple counter will come to the 0000 and whenever it reaches to the 1111 again it come back to the 0000 else it will just count by incrementing one so if it is in the position 1 or in 2 or in 3 then simply it will be just counting by incrementing 1 otherwise uh, whenever you will give reset it will come to 0 and after 1111 it will just come back to 0000 so this is the ripple counter now the next question is write a very long code to swap the content of two registers with and without using temporary registers so now it's a very interesting question First, what you have to do, you have to swap the two register values by using the temporary registers, and then what you have to do, you have to swap the values without using any temporary registers. So try to solve; it's very easy, and then we'll tell you the actual solution. So coming to the solution part, if you have the temporary registers, then to perform the swap operation, simply you can use the blocking assignment. You can assign one register value to the temporary registers, and then Uh, one by one assign the value but if you don't have any temporary registers and then also you have to swap the value of two registers that time you should use the non blocking assignment why what is the reason in case of non blocking assignment the assignment happen at the same time so the values of register will be just swapped however in case of blocking assignment the assignment will happen one by one so your register value will not be swapped so we need to use that temporary register that time so i hope it is clear to you guys in case of any doubt let me know in the comment box our last question is what is very long parallel case statement and full case statement so sometimes these kind of questions can also be asked in your interviews so uh, prepare these questions also try to know the reason and then we'll tell you the actual actual reason So coming to the solution part, in case of parallel case statement, your case expression will be matches to only one case item. If it is matches to more than one case item, that means it is not a parallel case. However, in case of full case statement, the case expression will matches to more than one case item. So this is the difference between the full case and parallel case statement. So this is it, guys. Today we have discussed ten very long interview questions. Uh, in first video, also we have discussed ten to twelve question, and uh, I am planning to come up with these uh, different question which is usually asked in your interview. So prepare well. In case of any doubt, let me know in the comment box. I am here to clear your doubts. So if you find my content useful, do like and share with your friends. This is the time to sign off. We will meet in the next video. Till then, goodbye. Take care.